What is overfitting? This is a common question in data science interviews, and so I want to give you the answer that's going to make you stand out the most. Remember, the basics are, those are simple answers, and anyone can give you the basic answer about overfitting. However, if you want to get hired, as a hiring manager, I'm listening for you to be capable of applying what you know, not just knowledgeable of a term like overfitting. So I want to give you an actual applied data science answer so that you sound like a data scientist, not like someone who read a textbook. And that's really important in your job interview is to sound like you can do the job. So what is overfitting? You have to cover the basics. And so let's go through that first. What is overfitting? Well, the goal of a model is to learn a function. That function maps your inputs to your prediction, whatever the inference you're serving is. The more overfitted your model, the less you've learned the function and the more your model is a representation of the data set in a different form. So that's bad. Why? Well, your model gets into production and it fails. It, if you're doing any sort of monitoring, you'll see it drift almost immediately. Why? It doesn't perform well on out of sample, out of distribution, new data that comes in, new cases, basically. And so since it's overfitted, generalization is bad, fails in production. Those are the main points to cover. So what do you do? What, what will help when it comes to overfitting? And so now you have to talk about your basic pieces, uh, mitigation efforts. You got K-fold validation that's going to come to your mind almost immediately. Obviously, you want to improve your data. If you can increase the size of your data, if you can use any sort of resampling methodologies, if you can augment your data, and sometimes if you can just generally you know, just clean up your data, that will help too. You've got ensemble methods that will help significantly. You want to cover your reduction and simplification techniques, make the model simpler, make it better. You've got just any sort of regularization, early stopping, and then talk about your validation mechanisms because k is just the beginning. You have an entire ecosystem of ways that you can validate a model to detect the fact that it's overfitted and then start doing a little bit of the mitigation methods and simplification methods. Talk about dropout. All of those are your traditional answers. And so now, what do you do to sound like an applied data scientist? Because what you've done is given the textbook answer. Now, the next piece really requires you to have a little bit of background in research. Like you've read the research on the, the issues that now change because you're using deep learning and more advanced model architectures. All of a sudden, overfitting isn't always a bad thing. There's good overfitting and there's bad overfitting. You're going to talk about your double descent curve. And that's something that you want to be, you definitely want to be familiar with double descent and the research that's been done to understand why in deep learning, very, very deep, complex models, overfitting's good sometimes. There is good overfitting. We don't 100% understand why. So you're grappling with some of the concepts that we, in the real world, have to come to terms with in order to deploy reliable models. And so now we talk about it, the key terms here to understand are explainability, model explainability, and robustness, model robustness. Now, I'm going to do an entire video on explainability because it's a very complex concept and I could spend the next 20 minutes talking about explainability. So I'm going to move that off to another video. Robustness is the minimum that you need to cover because robustness means that your model can handle, it generalizes very well to not only uh, novel cases that you are aware of, but maybe some cases that you don't have represented in your data. This is talking about learning that complex function, which you probably don't understand the shape of. You don't understand the form of that function. And so that's where a lot of your, your uh, overfitting problems come into play. And so with deep learning, now we have this trade-off. We have good overfitting, and we have bad overfitting. Now, how do you figure out which one's which? And part of that's explainability. Explainability goes a long way to understanding how each one of those inputs actually impacts and how much of an impact it has on the inference that you're serving, on the outputs of your model. And so that's a core piece of explainability that you need to understand is beginning to do that mapping and figure out how your model actually works and that will lead to a lot of pruning and reduction. 
So again, back to simplification. It's a great way to manage bad overfitting is to get rid of some of that noise that's seeped into your model because deep learning models learn the function. But in many cases, if you look at the research, the deep learning model actually memorizes. It's got data embedded in it, memorizes some of the data. And you can actually, if you use adversarial methods, get it to feed you back raw data that it was trained on. And now we get into adversarial training methods, which is one way that you can make your model more robust, less overfitted, better able to generalize and handle any sort of out of sample data or out of distribution data. So you can talk about gener you know, generative adversarial networks. You can just talk about the concept of adversarial training in general to combat overfitting. But now, and again, this is where you get into how this impacts the real world. Because in a business, I mean, you can't train forever, right? You have deadlines that you have to meet. And so there's a trade-off. You can make your model uh, infinitely robust. And that would require way more time than you have. You can train for every scenario. And now you're talking about costs. The cost of the hardware and time that it's going to take to build this model, we have to justify that. Is it really worth all that extra time to make it infinitely robust? No, there's a robust enough. How do you figure out what that is? And this goes back to your business case. You have to understand the scenarios that the model will most frequently encounter and the ones that it must perform best at in order to meet the business need and provide value to the business. But on the other hand, you also have to worry about what happens when it fails. What is the cost of any of those failures? And so you need to understand the, the scenarios and the data types that it will perform well on and the gray areas, the ones that it may not perform as well on. And then you have to put monitoring mechanisms in place and also safety nets for what happens when it does something really weird. You need something monitoring it to say, okay, that's weird. That shouldn't happen. And you can talk about ensemble methods this way or, you know, model monitoring model, but you have to have something in place as a safety net to handle the fact that you can't train forever and you're not going to make your model infinitely robust. So you have to end up addressing all of the main business cases, all of the main scenarios that this model has to perform very well in. And then you have to create monitoring for the things you don't know, those scenarios that you don't understand yet, the types of data spaces that you don't have enough data to understand whether this model will perform well or not. You have to have monitoring in place to detect those, alert you, and allow you to retrain and redeploy the model. And you have to have some safety nets in place for when the model does something absolutely ridiculous. So those are the main points that you have to cover in a more advanced answer to questions about overfitting. So remember that you have to go through the textbook answer, but you also have to make it real world. You have to make it an applied answer in order to get hired. Because again, hiring managers are looking for not just knowledge of, but capability of. We want to know that you can actually do this and you understand some of the business constraints like cost and scheduling. And you've got to deliver something that actually works and functions in production the way that the business needs it to. So how do you do that knowing that you can't train infinitely? Those are the types of answers that will make you sound like you've done data science before and you're ready to contribute to the team.